NASCAR has been and always will be a very dangerous sport. No matter how much technology advances and how many safety precautions are put in place, every driver is putting themselves at risk by driving bumper to bumper at nearly 200 miles per hour. While thankfully there have been no fatalities in NASCAR's top three divisions since the 2001 Daytona 500, and the requirement of the Hans devices soon thereafter, there have been numerous injuries and close calls. Even as recently as 2022, veteran driver and Cup Series champion Kurt Busch was forced into early retirement due to a severe concussion sustained in a seemingly mild qualifying crash at Pocono. That incident, and one nearly identical to it later that year at Texas with the driver Alex Bowman, were both due to the stiffness of the then-new Gen 7 car, which NASCAR worked tirelessly to make safer as the year went on. But still, even with a more forgiving style of car and proper in-car restraints, there's still plenty of room for freak accidents to potentially turn deadly. And in 2022, just one week after Alex Bowman's concussion, that nearly happened in the Chevy Silverado 250 Truck Series race at Talladega. Thanks to his accolades in late model racing across the Carolinas, Jordan Anderson secured his first two NASCAR Truck Series starts in 2014 at the age of 23. His debut with Make Motorsports ended early with electrical issues, but in his second outing with the Mike Harmon Racing Team, he made it to the finish in 30th. That latter partnership carried over to 2015, and Anderson ran most of the schedule in the number 74 truck, recording a best finish of 13th at Michigan. On paper, it looks as if it was a planned effort, but Anderson admittedly almost emptied his own bank account trying to qualify for the season opener at Daytona, which he ultimately failed to qualify for. His time in NASCAR could have very well ended right there, but thankfully, Mike Harmon brought him back the next week at Atlanta, where he stayed out of trouble to bring home a 23rd place finish, and from then on, continued to impress Harmon each race by keeping the truck clean, and thus continued to receive opportunities. All in all, Anderson made 17 starts for Harmon that season, only missing the field twice and recording a solid 21.7 place average finish for the underfunded team. And most importantly for them, he didn't wreck out of a single race. Over the next two years, Anderson continued to compete for back-of-the-pack truck series teams and earned just enough to keep his career moving forward. In 2016, while driving for the startup of Bullen Motorsports team, he posted a new best finish of 11th at Gateway. But despite the good on-track results, the team parted ways with him entering the 2017 season. With no consistent ride lined up at the start of the new season, Jordan reunited with Mike Harmon to attempt the season opener at Daytona, but they would once again fail to qualify. The next week at Atlanta, while driving his own truck in partnership with Rick Ware Racing, he suffered a hard crash, and because he couldn't afford the significant repairs, his time in NASCAR was likely up. But thanks to a successful online effort, his own fans and small sponsors put together enough funding to not only finish the repairs on his truck, but keep it running throughout the rest of the season. While he was still running under the TGL Motorsports banner for much of that year so as to use their owner's points, Anderson announced he'd be going fully independent for 2018 with his self-named Jordan Anderson Racing Team. And in his first race as an official owner-driver at Daytona, he punched far above his weight class, running inside the top five in the closing laps and exiting turn four in the final lap, it looked like he could finish there. But unfortunately, he came together with a 20 of Scott Legassi Jr. just before the finish line and spun across in ninth place. Regardless, he kept his truck out of the wall and left the track with his first ever top 10 finish, along with a pretty big check from the highest paying race on the schedule. Mostly driving old Brad Keselowski racing trucks for the rest of that season, Anderson's results noticeably improved from the years prior, and he even upped his best finish to 7th at Talladega. The next year in 2019, he didn't come up with any more top 10s, but his average finish remained exactly the same as in 2018 with a 19.5, and he recorded a personal best six straight top 20 finishes between Kansas and Chicagoland. In his first two full-time seasons as an owner-driver, Anderson showed good potential in the super speedways and continued to demonstrate excellent consistency in clean driving the whole time. Heading into 2020, it was apparent that Anderson was no longer just a backmarker, and while it would take a miracle for his trucks to contend for wins on the standard mile and a half or short track, it was certainly possible for him to do so with the help of the draft. Here they come to the line. It's the white flag. The next flag will end the race. Yellow or checkers. And it's Grant Infinger out front. You know Ross Chastain oh, going to make Chastain. that move. Oh, Barely what a save. save. Bottom. Get bottom. Jordan Don't Anderson in second behind Infinger. 
Zane Smith trying to come from the outside, looking for a little help. Down the back stretch into turn three, it's still in finger. Jordan Anderson second, Cody Robaugh third. He's hooked to him, this is gonna be a big move. Anderson swings outside. He's gonna get him. Jordan Anderson. And Grant Infinger at the line. It's gonna be Infinger. Middle middle, you got it. What a throw. Grant Infinger does it. And it's the 100th win for Ford. I could have sworn when Jordan Anderson got to the outside. I thought Anderson had it won. For Anderson, the second place finish was easily the team's best performance thus far and gave them exposure to fans and sponsors alike. However, the finish itself was a crushing defeat, and following another year of mediocre results, he opted to turn his focus to the ownership side of things and expand his team into the Xfinity series. While continuing to field his number 3 truck for himself and a variety of part-time drivers, he also attempted to bring his number 31 car to the Xfinity series full-time in partnership with John Bomarito and a technical alliance with Richard Childress Racing. In the Xfinity Series practice at Daytona, Anderson timed in at 20th, showing enough speed to easily make the field given a clean qualifying lap, but when qualifying was rained out and the starting lineup was to be determined by owner's points, he was forced to pack up early as the new team had no Xfinity owner's points to fall back on. Even worse was that because of the ongoing pandemic, NASCAR limited qualifying that season to only a few significant races, the next of which was in the 11th race at the Circuit of the Americas. But there, with the help of RCR Cup rookie and back-to-back -back Xfinity champion Tyler Reddick, the 31 team would finally make its debut and finish strong in 8th place. The next race at Charlotte coincidentally also featured real qualifying, and Reddick would once again make the most of the car and bring home a 5th place finish. So in just the team's first two races, Reddick's impressive runs had already vaulted the team to 41st in owner's points, but in order to make the next race in mid-Ohio where there would be no practice or qualifying, they needed to be in the top 40. It appeared as if the JAR team would have to sit out the next two races before they could attempt to qualify in on speed at Nashville, but thanks to a loophole they found, they not only made the show in mid-Ohio, but competed in every remaining race that season. The rule was that if no real qualifying session was to be held, then the top 40 in owner's points would make up the field. But if a team outside the top 40 in owner's points was to enter a driver who had won a race earlier in that season, then they would be guaranteed a spot in the field. So by signing Josh Berry, who had won at Martinsville a few weeks back to race at Mid-Ohio, the JAR group was in the show, bumping out the 40th place NBA Motorsports team. And with a very impressive 8th place finish in his first road course start, Barry moved the team well into the top 40 of owner's points, which kept them locked into all of the remaining non-qualifying races. As for their results, in 23 starts, they racked up 2 top 5s and 6 top 10s, including a 5th place finish from Anderson himself in the fall Talladega race. So while his Xfinity team in partnership with Bomarito and RCR was off to an immediate success and had signed on Homestead winner Myatt Snyder to drive full-time in 2022, Anderson's independently owned truck series team had not made significant progress. On the bright side, he brought home another second place run at Daytona and even scored his first non-super speedway top 10 finish at Darlington, but at that point his main focus was on managing the Xfinity team, and so he had other drivers take over the number 3 truck for most of the races that year. But with many inexperienced drivers rotating in and out week by week, Results for the truck team went noticeably down, and after Jordan failed to qualify for the first race of 2022, he was left with little choice but to run the team part-time. Heading into the Talladega race weekend, the team had only started five races, with Anderson getting them a best of 14th at Texas. But if they had any shot of getting back into winning contention, it was at Talladega. With Anderson behind the wheel, the number 3 truck showed significant speed in qualifying, timing in 9th quickest and beating out multiple manufacturer-supported teams. When the green flag dropped on race day, Anderson's speed didn't go away and he hung inside the top 10 for almost the entire first stage, battling it out with the best in the series. But while running 4th with just a few laps to go on the stage, it would all turn upside down, and fans at the track and on live TV would both witness one of the closest calls in NASCAR history. And the caution oh, is man. out. Jordan Anderson. 
we talked about Jordan being in the field, and man, there is a lot of fire. I'm sorry, but get out. Oh, man, look at that thing stop. And that's a big hit. Oh, wow. oh my goodness. Wow. That was, he, he didn't know where he was. Yes. He couldn't see couldn't where see. he was, and he knew he had to get out. So lucky that he was able to get above the wall and out that door. Holy cow, that was dramatic. Due to a ruptured oil line, Anderson's engine caught fire, which then immediately spread into the cockpit. The smoke was so intense that it began suffocating him before he could bring the truck to a safe stop. So facing no other option before losing consciousness, he pointed the truck at the inside wall and prepared to climb out. And while he executed his plan perfectly, as you can see by the slowed down footage, there was a wide margin for error. There is no doubt that if he exited the truck a second earlier or later, or a few inches higher or lower, he could have been seriously injured, or worse. And that's pretending as if he wasn't already injured, because in the roughly 20 second frame from when the truck caught fire until Anderson exited, he received second degree burns to his neck, arms, hands, and knees. But somehow, someway, that was it. Most fans assumed that his premature exit from the truck was accidental, or at least that he didn't know he was about to hit the wall at a relatively high speed. But according to Anderson, he was fully aware of what was happening the whole time. You, you got to think about the fact that there's 30 trucks behind you at that point. So I started going, and you actually see at one point um, when the truck veered back to the right to the left, steering wheel was already off at that point because I'd already tried to come out. So there was no there was no steering, um, but I knew I needed to get slowed down and get out of there because when I first popped up, I'm like, going too fast. So that's when I went back in and jabbed the brakes as hard as I could, and it turned left, right, and it just... By the grace of God, nobody hit me, um, you know, because I came literally right back up in front of the field. And um, thinking back on that deal, I just, I could kind of see where I was going. I couldn't see out the front, but I could see out to the left because the window net was down. So as it's coming back to the infield, I'm like, you know what, if I can aim toward the wall and be here ready to go out, that's probably my, my best bet. So I, like, I knew where I was. I knew kind of where I was going, and, and the plan was just to try to be close to getting out. So I didn't want to get trapped because I knew the back stretch wall at Talladega was pretty tall. The back, back stretch wall and a lot of these tracks are pretty tall. I just didn't want to get to the point where I was up against the wall pinned in it. So I was like, I'm just going to sit here on the edge. And you know, I wish I could say that I was that coordinated that way. It ejected me out of there. I landed right in between the safety barriers. Because you got to think, though, the safer walls, there's probably four feet in between each foam barrier. And when I came out of the truck, I landed right on top of one. And thank God it wasn't in the middle of one or sideways or something. So uh, just that whole thing. And I kind of go back to thinking what father-in-law Larry said that more right went wrong that whole situation out of the truck that certainly could have been a lot worse a lot of a lot of different scenarios NASCAR posted a video of the crash to their official YouTube channel within the same day of the race so in no way am I saying that they're trying to censor it but I would have to say this crash is one of the most overlooked close calls in NASCAR history especially considering how recent it was the crash pretty much ended in the best possible scenario, and even then, that was with the driver getting airlifted with severe burns. It's just that the more you play it back, and the more you look at the angle Anderson had to climb out of the truck, and the angle the truck took once it hit the wall, the more you realize just how terribly things could have ended. But moving on, just four weeks after the incident, Anderson was back at the track working hard with his Xfinity Series team. And the following spring, when he made his return to Talladega, he ended up in victory lane as his driver Jeb Burden delivered the JAR team their first ever win. It was certainly a great way to bounce back, but Anderson wasn't just satisfied with his owner roles alone, as later that season, he made his return to the driver's seat at Daytona, driving a third Xfinity Series entry for his own team. There, he finished a respectable 15th place, but after that one-off race, he didn't get back behind the wheel until this season's opener at Daytona, where he proved that he still has what it takes to contend for wins. Again piloting a third JR entry, he avoided all the nice carnage and was out front with three laps to go, before unfortunately getting too far out ahead of the pack and losing his lead to Austin Hill. But by avoiding a crash in the final lap, he still recovered to finish an Xfinity Series career best of fourth place, crossing the stripe right behind his teammate at Parker Retzloff. And as of the recording of this video, that's where this story ends. The story of a grassroots owner driver, a young and potential filled Xfinity Series team, and one of NASCAR's closest calls of all time. Also, I just had to point out that ever since the Daytona race this season, Jordan has been helping out the struggling Mike Harmon racing team by basically giving them the JAR number 32 car's owner's points and letting Mike operate his own team under the JAR banner. 
it's just really cool to see that relationship come full circle since Mike was the first guy to give Jordan a major opportunity in NASCAR. But yeah, that's all for today's video. So if you did enjoy it, please make sure to hit that like button and subscribe. I know it's been a bit since my last upload, so sorry about that, but I've been extremely busy with school as I predicted I would be. And now that I'm on spring break, I'll try to get a few more videos uh, ready to bridge the gap between now and the summer. But other than that, I don't really have any other channel announcements or anything. So just stay tuned for about once every two week uploads for now. And until next time, peace out.